I remember the exact day I wanted to go to Rainbow, to go to Rainbow, to go to Rainbow, to go to Rainbow, to go to Rainbow. Based. Mwah. Remember the exact day I wanted to go to Rainbow, and it was when I watched one of Kevin Ellis's videos. He did his first ever trip there, Peg Five. I remember it vividly, and uh, he put it up on Vimeo, which at the at that point was sort of like it was becoming the new YouTube as such. Vimeo was so it wasn't about a lot and uh, a friend of mine recommended that I watch this Kevin Ellis because he's quite a funny geezer and uh, he's quite down to earth and yeah I remember watching it and seeing what Rainbow entails and the the fishing that you have to do there and some of the snags that are there and I just thought wow I'd you know, I didn't quite expect it to be what it was. Never seen it in video format sort of thing. And I thought, I've got to go. You know, I've got to go. How, why did I turn down so many trips beforehand? And then at that point, I realised quite how difficult it was to go to Rainbow. And that was it then. The minute I realised that, you know, it's impossible to get on there, I just thought, you know what, I have to go. I've got, there's got to be some way of getting on there and luckily for me at the time I was working in a fishing tackle shop and one of the guys that I grew up fishing with Paul Hudson on the local lakes around my area there was someone that come in the shop and I was sort of, I was basically punishing everyone that come into the tackle shop do you know anyone that fishes rainbow do you know anyone they said yeah funny enough Paul Hudson fishes there he's got six trips there a year normally has sort of two week trips there and and yeah you could probably contact him and I thought well you know I knew Paul quite well from being a youngster where I used to fish the local lakes we you weren't obviously allowed to night fish so you had to be accompanied by an adult and Paul always you know he always used to punish him basically and go oh is it right you know if I fish up up the way and what have you and uh, you're right to accompany me for the night said, yeah yeah so I managed to get hold of Paul's number and uh, yeah got myself in and I'll never ever forget that very first trip to Rainbow and that was the point where big fishing or big carp fishing took just went up another level like you wouldn't believe so my first milestone capture on rainbow I suppose was the first fish that I caught on there because the bite that very first bite is frightening uh, and no matter how much how many bites I've filmed at rainbow none of it does it justice unless you're actually there and I never knew a rod could bend that much while sat on an alarm without just busting in a million pieces so I suppose, in a way, that first capture was a milestone capture for me. It was a 49 pounder, absolute gorgeous, gorgeous fish. It had everything, you know, out in the boat, epic boat battle, and uh, was amazing. But a 49 pounder at Rainbow isn't what you go to Rainbow for. Now, I know it's a big fish, but you don't go there to catch 40s. You don't really go there to catch 50s or 60 pounders because there's many places in France that you can go to to catch that sort of size of fish. So when you're at Rainbow, I think that, that sort of milestone is definitely a 70 pounder. There's something very Jurassic about a 70 pounder. I've caught a fair few 60s and the minute they go over that 70 pound mark, they just take on this prehistoric, ridiculous, so everything about a 70 pounder is colossal you know it's it's quite again hard hard to put into words because unless you're holding a fish of that sort of stature you never really words can't you know sort of express how incredible that moment is so my first that milestone capture on there would have been 
thousand scale, the 70 pounder that I had from there. Now, it was quite a fairy tale story that because when I did my very first trip, I played a fish, I believe the timer down in the corner was, I, I'd played it on the bank for about 10 minutes, it got snagged up, gone out in the boat and then played it for a further, I think it was 27 minutes out in the boat, couldn't get it up off the bottom and it actually snapped, I was using a lead core hook link and it snapped that lead core hook link and that killed me, that, you know, that, that was a big fish, I lost that one. And then my second trip, I had the same, scene, same thing happen again. Hooked a big fish midway through the trip. It was up by the boat, looked like a 70 pounder, went to net it, it fell off. And I'm like, wow, you know, you go to Rainbow to catch these big ones and yet these moments keep happening where, you know, these big fish are sort of avoiding me. And then third trip again, I, we were on the island, big fish didn't happen. Um, and it was one of them things. So, so it took until my fourth trip, four years later from going to Rainbow. So I've been going regularly now, uh, get one trip a year, two week trips. Four years later, me and Paul were on the island. First week, bit of a struggle, caught a few fish, etc. Second week, again, caught a few fish, but no rainbow monster you know why isn't this happening you know this is why you come to rainbow why aren't you know <laughs> where's these 70s at and it got to the friday of the very you know, so the very last day you have to be off saturday in the morning at 10 o'clock you've got to be up at that clubhouse and friday evening had no evening bites whatsoever on the whole trip and then eight o'clock friday evening left hand rod zooped over and you just I just knew from that moment that that when you put that foot that very first foot in the boat and you've got a rainbow carp on the end and at where I'd hooked this fish from was a good sort of almost 200 yard tow across you know savage rainbow land that's why you keep the lines out of the water but we'll talk about that a bit later um yeah, the minute I took this fish, foot in the boat, just knew from that point on something special could happen here. So I've gone out, out on the island. You've got you've got so many bars, but before you get to sort of the swimming pool area, we call it. So I suppose that there's a there's a row of bars sticks that are sticking up out of the water, which are about a hundred yards out. And then once you get past them sticks it then goes into the swimming pool area. Now, um, unfortunately, the battery was dying on the boat. It's Friday, I've done a two week trip, came the battery on the boat, that's running out. So I'm trying to put, use the fish to pull myself out there. And the problem is with doing that is I'm then pulling the fish towards these sticks that are 100 yards out. And I managed to just get to the point where I was about to pull him into this horrible bar that as, I end, as, as the boat went over the top of the bar, the fish then started to play around in the deep water in this swimming pool area. It's sort of, you know, it's a good 20 foot deep around there. So I managed to get the other side of the bar quick and the fish has sort of veered round and come underneath the boat and I've got a glimpse of it and thought, oh God, here we go. You know, I've been here before, you know, where I've, I know that this is a giant fish and it's swung underneath the boat. It's come up on its side. And it was a bit random this one because I've never sort of wanted a target fish out of Rainbow or anything. But on the way up to this trip, whilst me and Paul were driving there, I said to him, you know, that thousand scale, I'd love to, love to catch that one out of there. And as soon as it come up and saw it, straight, knew straight away, shouted back at Paul, yeah, it's thousand scale. And then he's brought me that back down to reality by going, yeah, mate, but it's not in the, not in the net yet. So... Let me tell you, them next sort of 20, maybe 30 seconds were probably the longest of my life as that fish come up on the surface, breach the surface. And when you're staring at the first 70 pounder that you've ever hooked before and he's up on the surface gulping air and you're in a boat that's got no battery on it and you have to use the rod to steer the boat and everything. That point, when that fish went in into the net, I, I had an out of body experience. Yes. <laughs> oh man. 
<laughs> that is a pig, dude. That's a 70. That's a 70. Oh, mate. <sighs> and I have never felt elation quite like it. And then to be able to hold that fish in my arms and to know that, you know, that milestone had almost, you know, four years waiting or for the back of a two week trip where, you know, we, I still hadn't had this monster. And then finally it happened on the last night. I just can't begin to express to you how, you know, pure ecstasy. It, it, that's the only way you could ever describe it, you know, an out of body experience. And uh, I never quite thought that a capture like that could ever sort of do that to me or may, make me feel them sort of emotions. So targeting the bigger ones in rainbow, I would say it is difficult. Now, I'm, a 40 pound fish is a massive fish and I, I dread to think how many 40 pounders I've actually caught out of rainbow now. Now, when I very first started going to rainbow, when Paul, Paul would catch a 40 or a 50 and I'd hook it by the side of the boat and then put it back and I'm like, how can you do that? You know, how, what are you doing? Bring it back. You know, I want to film it. I want to see them all. But since now we've been going, God, this must be my seventh year I've been going to Rainbow now. I get what he means because of how, I dread to, like I said, I dread to think how many 40 pounders I've had. And you're always in that mindset of you're not going to Rainbow to catch 40s or 50s. A 60 pounder is a big fish, but it's not, it's not a rainbow fish, is it? There's 70s in there, there's 80s in there, the lake's done 90s. So that's what you're after in there. And because of them 40 pounders and 50 pounders that are in there, and because of how many there are, it's difficult, you know, having them sort of milestone captures of them 70s and 80s with the possibility of a 90 pounder, yeah, it's difficult to, sort of target that or you don't know what to do i tend to take a lot of bait when i fish peg 17 18 if i can picture it for you now there's a lot of deep water there so it's sort of 30 foot deep in front of the swim that goes out sort of gradually goes up you've got 23s 24 it's all up and down but it's very deep water and you're fishing out towards an island that have got huge trees that are falling in towards you and you're fishing in between them trees as, as much as you dare, but them fish live right at the back of them trees in that deep water. So them two pegs, they warrant putting a lot of bait in to drag them out, to get their confidence out, to catch them. Now I've heard of other people go, oh yeah, but it's better if you only drop four or five baits down on them and then wait forever for a bite. I'm not... I don't feel like that's the way of fishing that them pegs. I feel like the best way is is to bait the arse out of it, get their confidence up, get and drag them away from them snags right at the back, so that then you can build up all their confidence of hopefully catching one of them monsters. But on the other side of that, you're obviously giving all of them smaller fish confidence of coming out and then bigger fish may be sitting back slightly or, or sitting, you know, in the deeper water this way more. So it's working that out and trying to sort of get your approach right to catching them bigger ones rather than sort of catching them 40s and 50 pounders all the time. It's lovely getting bites on there, don't get me wrong. But again, you've always got to be in that mindset of, you're at Rainbow to hopefully catch one of them 70s or 80s. You're not there to catch what you would normally catch on most French venues. That's well, one significant capture. Now, this isn't a Rainbow story, but it is a French story, and it's at Shanty. And there's not many photos I've ever framed, if any, to be honest, other than this one, where myself and... Brad from Fox, cameraman from Fox, we 
we're on a three day trip to Shanty. Three days is not long enough uh, out there, you know, uh, and we now realize that, but we just, we took a punt on it. And when we got there, the tow to get to the swim that we were at, we didn't get there till about half nine, 10 o'clock at night. And Andreas, our um, German consultant, was fishing a peg, God knows how far away. And um, it, he's obviously directed us in. He said, can you see my head torch and all that? It was like it's this tiny little star a million miles away in the background. Yeah, yeah. He said, just come towards that light and, uh, and you'll get to the swim. So we've loaded up. It's, it's now pitch black. It's 11 o'clock at night. We've got a couple of boats in tow and we're going across Shanty for the very first time. And this is one of the first times that Brad's ever been in a boat as well. And I've got the echo sounder on, so I'm reading the echo sounder, making sure that the engine's not going to cut out and it's sort of, you know, it's reading 10, 12 feet. We get to this one point where it's like, oh God, it's a foot deep, you know, and bringing the engines up. We had a palaver get into the swim. We've got into the swim, like I said, late at night. It's about midnight at this point. And... Uh, Andreas is, oh, you're, you're going to get your head down sort of thing. So, no, mate, <laughs> you know, I'm at Shanty. I'm putting the rods out. Oh, you can't tow out, you know, this late at night. Storm's coming, this, that, and you know. I said, well, it doesn't matter. I'll, I'll, I'll wade one in the edge. And he's sort of looking at me like, wade one in the edge? I think Shanty's, what, 10,000 acres? And you're going to wade one out into the edge. So he's looking at me all funny and what have you. Now, at this point, Andreas had been in the swim for a week and hadn't caught anything, I believe, up to that point. And yeah, so I've then gone out, waded until my weight, you know, I don't know, four or five rod lengths out in front of the swim, drop the rod down, and for the tigers over the top, come back. I think I put three rods out for that night. And he's looking at me like, you won't catch anything there, you know, thinking, he's bloody English, idiot. And yeah, next day, comes round and he's like right you're gonna you know go out in the boat do the normal shanty thing tow them out a million miles like they do on there and I thought you know what I'm gonna leave one of them in the edge and he's like you know what's the but you know again looking at me far I thought no well I'll put I'll put a few out in the pond the shanty way but I'll leave that one in the edge just like the drop just like the feeling that I had by dropping that one well that day <laughs> Andreas and Brad, they've gone off um, filming him dropping a rod in one of these bays. I'm um, just sat there and I've looked up and I've seen what I thought was a carp on this shallow area just in front of us. I thought, is that a fit? And then with that, the rod's whacked over. This one that I've waded out. I've looked into this fish. I've looked round. Brad's a million miles away. So it's very rare that, obviously, whilst I'm... Um, I'm out filming all the time and it's very rare that I get a moment quite like that to myself as such. And it was literally just me and 10,000 acres and no one else there and I'm playing my first ever shanty fish. And that experience was, was yeah, different, a lot different to my angling because like I say, I film everything, whether I'm out for myself or not I've always got something going on and I'm always filming so at that point I've I've just had that moment to myself which was a bit of a, like I say a rarity and this fish gave me such an awesome battle on this shallow plateau and play, playing braid you know you, anyone that uses braid you you feeling absolutely everything it's almost the rod is part of your arm and I've walked out, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm so buzzing that I've hooked this fish, especially from the edge after telling, you know, Andreas is a very good shanty angler. He's lived on there for many, many years. You know, he's caught a lot of fish from there. So that just was made it all that bit more sweeter. And I've kicked my shoes off and I'm walking out and I can feel the clay in between my toes and I'm playing this fish as it's rolling around in front of me. And I'm just having this moment all to myself. And then landed this fish, and oh, I didn't care how big it was. It was probably one of Shanty's smallest fish in the world, 12 pounder. But yet, do you know what? That has been one of the most special captures ever. And the photo of that fish, 
is literally just breathtaking. The the work that Brad's done on it is unbelievable. When he took the photo, now we want it, uh, at Shanty, you get the most epic sunsets there. Uh, they're unexplainable. And we wanted to get the sunset behind me whilst I'm holding this fish, which is difficult to do. And when Brad took the photo on the back of the screen, it's just black basically, but where he knows what he's doing, he can bring it up in the edit. And that photo is, it puts the whole sunset into perspective, the moment I'm feeling into perspective. And like I said, that is one of the fish that I've framed, not the biggest fish in the world, but one that's definitely meant the most to me. I think one of the things that we all do as carp anglers is we're wondering whether what we're doing is right or wrong or that, and that is the beauty about fishing. And that's something that I think a lot of people forget, including myself. You're set up in a swim, you've set your stall out, you've, bait, you've, you've done what you can, you've found your spot, you've baited your spot, you've, you, you're using rigs that you feel confident in, but then, Things happen where the geezer opposite you is catching more than you, or the geezer to the left of you is catching more than you. Something's going on where you're like, something ain't right, you know, why, why aren't I catching? And then you end up doing stupid things, like using rigs that you wouldn't normally use. You think it's the bait. Oh, it's the bait. The bait's not right. You know, this, this is... A, and we've all fell foul to that. And... I always have a word with myself and think, look, you know, think about what you've caught whilst doing what you're doing. You know, you found that spot. Is it the best spot that's that you found? Well, I wouldn't be fishing it if it wasn't. So you can mark that off. Is the rig right? Well, I've caught so many fish on that rig. Why wouldn't it be right? Is the bait right? I've caught so many. So you, you've always got to remember that and... I think where a lot of people or where we can all foul, you know, wrong in our angling is by doing silly things, changing things when if you've got if you've gone in and you haven't found that right spot, then I understand that you want to change that spot or change that area. But I've all you've always got to look at a bit of a backup plan. So if let's say I go to Rainbow and I've got four spots out there, I'll always bait another area, keep keep an eye on that area, always get a backup plan because not all four rods are going to be working for me. You know, there'll be one rod that might not work and, and this, that and the other. A perfect example of that was Peg 17, my very first trip there. There was this deep area, 23 foot of water and Paul said to me, that, you, that won't set the world on fire for the first week, but bait it, fish it. It's a big fish spot, come the second week. You should, you know, it should be rocking. And on my sec on my first trip, I it ended up becoming my very best rod. That rod did. Now on my second trip, uh, I actually went with an underwater camera, and there was bait already on the spot. And I was thinking to myself, well, the problem is I've never done that before. I've never dropped a camera down there and seen that there was bait on that spot. There was no doubt bait on that spot from the previous trip when I'd done really well. So I just thought, right, well. Because I know that, I've got that knowledge now, I won't bait as heavily as I normally would because there's bait still down there and I'll drop drop me rig in and fish it. Now I didn't catch a single fish on that, on that spot for the whole week. That rod sat there all week, never had a bite off of it and all the while I'm thinking, should I you know, move it. Should I do should I do something else with that spot? Now I had a backup plan behind the Brazilian, which is is not too far away from where that spot is. I'd just been regularly sort of peppering bait in there, peppering bait in there. And then it got to the point where I think it, I was eight days in, that rod hadn't done a bite and I thought, right, well now I've got to move it. You know, uh, that's my backup plan. And when I moved it, within an hour I'd had a 50 pounder off that rod. I thought, blimey now, you know, I've waited eight days, didn't have a bite off it, and then I've managed to catch. Now, I didn't change the rig or, or the tactics or the bait or anything like that because you've got to remember that 
them rigs and them, uh, and them baits that you catch on regularly, are uh, they work for you. Sometimes the area might not be right, so just having that backup plan and being mindful of that, rather than changing all your kit around, oh, my rods aren't right, my reels aren't right, etc. You know, just think about maybe the area that you're fishing more than the rigs that you should be using or all the other stuff that you're using. Because if you've caught regularly on all of that stuff, then there's no need to change that. It's just working the situation out a bit better. And having backup plans is definitely something that's, you know, done me good stead. So when it comes to big carp, people, uh, people get obsessed with things like moon phases, southwesterlies, big winds, etc. One thing I take most into my big fish angling is them being quite territorial, definitely. Big carp, I think if you look over, if you were to you know, weigh it up against the moon phases or the weather or the swim, and the area that fish gets caught, nine times out of 10, that fish will get caught more regularly in a certain area rather than on a moon phase or on a weather phase or on this phase. Take something like the Burfield Common, always used to get caught in that dogleg area, didn't it? You know, that was, that was an area that most people targeted to catch that fish. I know it's different now, but the situation's changed up there now. We won't get into that that 80 pounder that I've spoken about that lives in peg 1718. You know, I haven't seen that fish get caught anywhere else on the lake. Why? You know, what, what is he just living in that zone? The grass carp at Rainbow, they live in peg 1718. I've never caught a grass carp anywhere else out on the pond. Whereas in peg 17, I've had 20 grass carp and some of them I've put them back and the next day I've caught them again, same fish. They've just swam straight back out. And they, so I feel that something you wanna be looking at is perhaps not the moon phase. Yeah, it's great to look on your moon app and go, oh, it's 100% efficiency tonight, great. I'm on, a, I'm on an amazing moon phase. We all work, we're all busy. You can't sort of, you know, time your angling on, oh, I've got South Wesley coming next week, but you know, I've got work for that week or I've got, I've got, you know, whatever going on in my life and I can't fish on that moon phase. One thing you can do is target an area that that big fish that you might be targeting whenever you go. So if you can't, let's say it gets caught in that peg, fish opposite that peg or fish somewhere near that peg. You know, that fish is always, I feel, going to get caught nine times out of ten in one certain zone. And if you can fish that zone, as much as you possibly can, then I feel they are very territorial. I don't know if it, when that, when they get to a certain age, they become territorial like that, but that's how I like to target big carp in my own angling because of how busy I am. It's all about finding out where that big fish gets caught regularly from. If I could target one fish, past or present, it would have to be Mary. And the only reason why that is, is I've become obsessed by that fish when I was at college. That carp, for me, was everything. That, that, that photo where tail's holding it like a baby whale is quite possibly one of the best fish captures I think you'll ever see in your life, for me personally. And... Yeah, if there's one fish I could fish for, it would be that one. I was at college, 2001, Simon Scott was my lecturer, and you had one project that you had to do for the whole year, and it had to be a certain project, so whether it was a lake, uh, angling, or I don't know, a weed, or a fish, or whatever it was, you had to have a project of that whole year, and sort of dedicate a lot of your work on that one thing, and that become part of your grade at the end of the year and I did mine on Raysbury 1 back in 2001 got really obsessed by the place like you wouldn't believe and I was up there quite regular taking photos of the swim aerial maps and didn't have drones about at that you know back then and whatnot but I was up there a lot and got really really obsessed by that carp and wanted to catch it and I got my ticket on there and I think that was 
up 53 quid, I believe I paid for that. It was something ridiculously cheap to fish for one of the best carp in the land. And it died that month. I got my ticket. Absolutely, do you know what? I was heartbroken by it. So, if there is a fish that I could fish for past or present, it'd be Mary without a doubt. So, sort of rolling on from that question, if there's one water I would want to fish, it'd have to be Raysbury One. But Raysbury One back in them days, that, that you know, the fact that there was only was it 19, maybe 20 fish swimming about, and it was 120 acres of unmolested land that that's what does it for me and that is what I would have loved to have fished I don't know what I don't the problem is I got so obsessed by Mary there was still cluster swimming about at that time you have Mary's mate swimming around and I I wasn't obsessed by them carp like I was Mary so when Mary died that caned it for me you know that that absolutely killed it for me more so than the venue itself. But looking back now, I still had that opportunity to fish Raysbury One whilst it was in its heyday. And yeah, I'm gutted I never took that opportunity. So if there's one lake I could go back to and, and fish, it would definitely be Raysbury One back in the early 2000s. So that pinnacle moment, sort of big carp fishing where something's clicked, would have been pretty much working out big fish being territorial and the nutsy fish being territorial. That fish, I when I joined Nutsy, I didn't want to catch that one because there were so many other lovely ones in there. So I almost joined the place by avoiding that capture. But what I did do was studied what that big fish would do. Now there was an out of bounds area on Nutsy. Now Nutsy's an acre and a half big, tiny pond, small pond syndrome, let me tell you. Them fish were on edge from the minute you were on there. But when they went, there was a bridge, a wooden bridge, and under a little dog leg area, tiny it was, you know, you could, you could spit across it. And they would live in there. And you could almost hand feed them in there. So you got to see the big one every day in that, in that dog leg. It'd be there every single day. And the minute it would venture out underneath that bridge, it changed, that fish did. You could see its attitude change, the way it swam. Would it'd swim round in there like a garden pond fish in this out of bounds area. But the minute it come out past that bridge, it knew, you know, I'm under pressure here. This is, you know, it, everything changed. Now, what I watched that fish do a lot of the times was come out from the bridge and it would almost do a lap of the lake and it would end up in this snag in a swim called Kingfisher. So I pretty much had studied that for almost over two years and never fished that Kingfisher swim for two years. I thought, you know, that is where I'm going to catch that fish from because... That is, it, it was its territorial place, this snag was. The left-hand side, I thought, you know, that is, it gets caught fairly regular there as well, but only certain times a year. And that was more in the autumn time, it'd get caught from there, but it'd spend every day in this snag. So I wasn't having that. Once I'd caught the fish that I'd caught, I started baiting it early on. I think I started in February. And then it got to April and unfortunately someone else caught it from that zone, but from another swim fishing there. So when I did my year off of having the ump and then I went back there, I didn't fish anywhere else on the pond. I baited that one snag and it's in April and there was a guy on Nutsy who had fished on there for God knows how many years and he'd caught that fish like 12 times or something. I remember him saying to me, oh, I've caught more 50 pounders than Dave Lane. And I'm like, what? I'm like, mate, you've caught the same fish. To have, like that, that, it don't count that way. That's not how it works. And so he knew where that fish would get caught from quite regular. And when he saw me in there, my very first trip back, he said to me, you ain't catching that fish from here. Not this time of year. It lives, you know, you want to catch it from blah, blah, blah. But I'm like, nah, I'm going to catch it from here because I've, seen how many times that fish had lived underneath that snag 
once it come out from that out of bounds area. So that was the point that clicked for me that I knew that they then become quite territorial in that place. That fish, out of all of the pond, other than the out of bounds, is where it looked most natural. So when you could get up on the snag and watch the fish, and when I baited it, it used to come out and flank the bottom and actually catch the bait midair. So it, it never really got caught a lot on the bottom. It'd always get caught a lot. It was a mug off the top. So I didn't want to catch it off the top. I really wanted to catch it off the bottom. But watching how it acted under this bush and the way it would feed by flicking baits up, I thought, you know, that that's where I really got to study what a big carp does and, you know, that how it can live in an area and perhaps not get caught in that area by doing something as random as that fish was doing by eating them baits midair. So, you know, I designed a rig at that point. I thought, well, I had actually designed a rig that I used a bit of cork as the hook bait. Unflavoured, not, not flavoured at all, but I, made, I cut the cork up to look like a tiger nut because when I was baiting the area, it was flicking the tigers up, but because the water was murky, you could just about see his chops going in the murky water. So again, you know, that was another point that clicked for me where I thought there's a certain rig that will catch that fish. And I had a fish tank back at home and it was the first time I'd ever used the 360 rig because I wanted a hook that would spin that had a bit of cork on it so that no matter what angle the fish come in at, once it flicked it up off the bottom and then in the wake, I wanted the hook to stay up as long as it possibly can with this balanced bit of cork that took almost 20 minutes to drop it back down. And that would be that would be the rig and the area that I'd catch that fish from. So that's a point that it clicked for me, was studying that fish and working out the fact that they are territorial in these areas and there is certain rigs that will catch big carp like that. I think the biggest mistake I've ever made whilst in pursuit of a fish was not fishing the right bloody lake. That never helps. <laughs> so I got myself a Burfield ticket after trying to uh, catch myself a big common after obviously catching a big mirror. And yeah, lo uh, long story short, I'd got my ticket. I didn't want to know anything about Burfield. I wanted to work it out for myself. And the biggest mistake I made there was not actually realising that Farnham Flynn is not part of Burfield. You can walk, you have to walk around a certain part of Farnham Flynn to get to Burfield, but Farnham Flynn isn't actually Burfield. And I ended up fishing the wrong bloody lake. So I got lucky in the fact that I actually caught a bigger out of Farnham Flynn first night on there, thinking I'm fishing Burfield, thinking I'm... Billy Big Spuds by catching myself a 36 pounder first bite. Lo and behold, I wasn't fishing the right lake. So that is definitely my biggest mistake. Make sure that you know you're fishing the right pond. <laughs>so if I could relive a day of my angling I'm lucky enough to obviously film a lot of what I do so a lot of the times I am reliving that moment for me video is everything rather than a photo because unless that photo is taken well then you can't quite capture them emotions or them feelings that you have at that time and one of the moments in my angling life that I'm lucky enough to relive but would love to go back there and do it again is when I was fishing Frimley Pit 4 with my little one and beautiful summer's day just everything felt right you know you get them moments when you turn up at the pond everything feels right and I'd worked out this this area where the fish were living in this very shallow sort of snaggy bush but it didn't have snags underneath the bush didn't sort of protrude the water but they were living underneath this and the guys that fished this swim they always say oh it's 17 and a half wraps towards the bush and I'm like well, why are you casting it? it's really shallow around the edge I thought, just walk round there and what I did is sort of like reeled the reeled the tip reeled the rig up to the tip and then submerged it under the water dropped it underneath there came back walk round the bank, see the hook bait, chucked a few tigers over the top and 
I think it was my, was it my first 30 or uh, from the pond? I, I, I'm, I'm unsure. I caught a 30 pounder anyway, um, whilst I was there with my little one. And it's not only have I got a photo that captures the moment perfectly, I've still, I've got video footage of that moment where everything you could possibly want being a father and taking your son fishing happened that day. <laughs> no silly faces? No. Oh, what's up? I got to get And Carrie would be happy with that? Yeah. And that's a moment in my life that, or my angling life, that I would love to just relive over and over again. That, that time that I had with my little one at the pond, the way we caught the fish, the epicness of the battle and the bite and everything, just everything about it was perfect. So that is definitely a moment I would love to relive over and over again. So it's what motivates me to go fishing all the time. Not one question I do get asked a lot is, don't you get bored of it? You know, you're out filming all the time. You're out on the bank a lot. If I'm not fishing, I'm obviously filming out on the bank. It's an addiction at the end of the day. And it's something that I hope, touch wood, will never ever leave me. I wanna be fishing every day of the year. I think about it constantly. I think about my rainbow trips. On the minute I get home, I'm thinking about the next trip. I prepare for the next trip. I just, I think a lot of us have that in us. We're all addicted to carp fishing. You know, no, ma no matter how new you are to the sport or how old you are to the sport, it's an addiction that just is not quite like any other, I suppose. It's something that I think we all think about all the time. Whether you're at work plastering, fitting windows, laying bricks, you're always thinking about, when am I gonna get the rods out next? I wonder what the fish are doing. Are they thinking about me as much as I'm thinking about them? And that is the addiction, isn't it? And yeah, that I don't think will ever leave me, to be honest. And I think the more my kids grow up and the more adventures we have and the more I'm out there doing it is, is enough for me. And I don't think that feeling will ever, ever leave. I love it that much. I, it's, um, it's an obsession that I feel I've had from the very first time I ever went fishing from the age of two.